Hey everybody, Jay Widener, Reality Check. Thanks for watching, subscribe, and all that stuff. And help me out. Almost at forty thousand two hundred to go. Uh, I know something happens at forty thousand, but we'll see. Um, anyway, uh, the reason I haven't been putting out many shows in the last two weeks is I've been working because I went to the conference, <clears throat> had to do all the uh, yard work and the garden work afterwards, and uh, so I've been winterizing, putting everything away, and making sure the animals are all comfortable and warm and have their water and food and it's been a lot of work and I'm finally going to get to uh, do my uh, retirement here where I'm actually going to do two films. I'm going to do a film on alchemy and some of the stuff we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, this is a short documentary I want to put out. And then um, I'm going to put out another film with Ryder Lee, which is going to be based on some of the Stanley Kubrick work, only a view of it that no one's really ever kind of uh, seen before. I think you'll like it. It has to do with mind control and MK Ultra, and uh, it's going to be really amazing. So anyway, anyway, I'm here tonight with one of my favorite people. She's a reporter, investigator, looking into all sorts of the woo, and her name is Helena Resner, and she is a wonderful person. I met her through a synchronicity, um, and so as you know, I pay attention to my synchronicities, and so I paid attention to Helena after I met her. And I met her in a weird circumstance with uh, Andrew Collins, one of my favorite writers. I've been on this show several times uh, talking about what we're about to talk about tonight. Hey, how you doing? I'm great. What about yourself? Fantastic. Winter here is actually so beautiful. I, I can't even describe it. So, yeah. And I heard that the mountains glow in the winter where you're at. They do. If it gets down below 30 below, which it does for a couple of nights every year. Yeah, the mountains start glowing blue, which is a sign they're filled with all this like plasma, orgone energy. Highly charged, highly charged the, that mountain range and the dunes. And we can get into that later because I, we both know about the San Luis Valley very well and you more so than I. Well, yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting because um, like the uh, number of missing persons that are around here is really kind of um, hair raising. And you'll go to like Alamosa to go shopping. There'll be like missing, missing, missing these posts wow. with these, you know, mostly women, right? And you're like, oh, I wonder what's going on here. And we had a, 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 a just up the hill from down the street from me recently, there was a, a woman, a housewife who had disappeared on a bike ride about an hour away from here on Mother's Day 2020, yeah, 2020, a long time ago now. And uh, she just disappeared and then they found her body just like right near here. And uh, it's, it's just weird. It's got a, it's got a weird vibe about, about it as if there's some kind of spookiness going on, you know, cause the first cattle mutilations were here and- Yeah, snippy. And the, yeah, that's right. And uh, of course there's been a lot of uh, UFO activity and a lot of famous people like Stephen Greer used to come out here and, I don't know, interact with the aliens. I don't know what they were doing. By um, any chance, are these disappearances happening mainly in the dunes, uh, Sangre de Cristo, Blanca Peak area? Uh, it would appear to, yeah, especially the dunes. The so dunes, that's yeah. the geological focal point of the vortex of that region, which we can yeah. get into extensively, but maybe we should give some background first. Yeah, so let's talk about it. Um, as you know, I'm a really I did the uh, conference, the uh, disclosure fest, and I talked about the, you know the plasma universe and got a big huge response from it. And best the best lecture of the weekend, hands oh, down. Thank you, thank you. I heard that actually from several people. Yeah, and, you're very. Um, yeah, I think people need to understand um, what we're dealing with here, and that you know ninety nine percent of the universe is plasma and nobody really looks at it or investigates it. There's very few plasma scientists or physicists. And, um, and so it's kind of, it's kind of in, it falls to me in, into the realm of the mystical at this point, because the way I look at ideas is they first start out with the mystics and then it goes to the artists. Then finally it gets to the scientists and then finally it gets to the, 
everyday man, the politicians and the people who write textbooks and all that. So we're, we're only at the beginning of this idea where it's still in the mystical phase. And what I like about that is because I believe that the word mystical, it comes from the word mist. And I believe that that comes from this plasma universe. Because well, plasma mist is, exactly. is you know, luminous fog that people always, well, not always, but often encounter in these paranormal experiences is a plasma environment. It is. And people will be like driving their car down the road and all of a sudden they'll see this cloud of mist and they'll go into it and they'll have a, a paranormal out of body. Sometimes they've been to get abducted. Uh, all sorts of stuff happens. And um and, you know, I think that that there's this like thin veil between this reality and the next one. And I think electricity and plasma and this kind of uh, ionization of the atmosphere yeah. are what causes the break and the tear in kind of the time space continuum. What do you think? Well, the most current uh, science on plasma is that it is multidimensional in nature, right? You need plasma inside of a wormhole for it to function. So to go between dimensions, you have to have a plasma environment. Plasma is multidimensional. And now the most recent studies on ball lightning, which is a plasmoid, a natural plasmoid, which can behave intelligently, which we'll get into uh, as we progress here. But once you enter either um, a plasma mist or a, let's say a plasma bubble, a plasmoid, you are then in a multi-dimensional plasma bubble universe where time is not the same as it is here. There, there's probably no time there. So that's why people will drive into the plasma, the luminous bank of mist, and they'll have missing time experiences or what they perceive as abduction experiences when really you know, what you're encountering in that bubble universe could be anything from anywhere and they can portray themselves as anything to you to make you feel like you're on a spaceship potentially with greys, you know, dissecting things or doing their tests. But really these these could be any number of things, gin, fairies, call them what you want, but they're, they're not normally perceivable to us in this 3D reality. Yeah, they're denizens of this other universe, which it which sits alongside us. Um, I had, uh, uh, I met this guy, he was a construction worker and he got uh, hit very badly on the head while in a construction accident where a crane hit him on the head. And even though he had a hard head, it caused his brain to slam over to the other side. And he, you know, was in the hospital for like four days and he was like in a woozy, drugged out state. And uh, they said, you have to you know, go home for a couple of weeks can't go back to work until your head recovers. He had a brain bruise. And he went to, um, back to his apartment, his little shabby apartment. And he's like, you know, making himself some soup. And the drugs are kind of wearing off. So it's like 14 or 15 hours after he gets back. And he sees like humanoid, translucent beings in his apartment. Like not walking, but kind of gliding or long. And they're not paying any attention to it. And he's like, were they more white or black in color? Whitish. Whitish, white -ish. okay. Yeah, so the more yeah, ethereal. And, and, and translucent, but you could still see him. And he got, you know, completely interested in him. He started watching them and they noticed that he was watching them. So they started watching him, which just scared <laughs> the bejesus out of him because they were just staring at him, right? And he was like trying to read his book and acting like he wasn't <laughs> watching them, but they were there. And, you know, for the two weeks or two and a half weeks as he was healing, they were there and then they slowly started fading away as the brain bruise kind of disappeared. And then finally they went away and, you know, he told his doctor, doctor, said, oh, it's a hallucination, it happens all the time. He said, no, no, doc, they were, they were uh, like sentient beings. And, you know, like, yeah, the doc thought he was crazy. And so he gave up talking about it, but, um, you know this this is a real thing and if you get if your your brain is plasma and if you do certain damage to it um i've talked to people who've had traumatic brain injuries and they they are in another dimension literally they think they're another person they their kids don't know them anymore their husband like wants to get a divorce because they're married to a woman that they don't know and you know it's like it's it's a very interesting thing as you and, and once you transpose into that other dimension accidentally or on purpose, because you can do it on purpose, which I highly recommend you don't do not do, um, 
you you will deal with entities that are in a lot of cases are more powerful than you are. And a lot of people who have experienced these, well, the proper term is time storms, uh, these yeah. luminous banks of plasma mist. Uh, after that experience, they're never the same. All of a sudden, they're highly creative. They're, they're now an artist. They're now a musician. This was not at all who they were before. It changes them completely, oftentimes, if not every time. Yeah, I'm thinking of a Credo Mutwa. Uh, he was like uh, up in the mountains in South Africa, and this, he saw this mist and crackling sound of electricity. And the next thing you know, he thinks he's being abducted and uh, he has... Uh, meets a, a, a creature who comes in to like collect his uh, feet, you know, his uh, his uh, fluids and, you know, it completely flips him out and his whole life changes, he says, at that point where, you know, he became a completely different person and lost all of his friends and gained new friends, of course. But um, yeah, it happens. And uh, I think we have to come to grips with this. And I think, you know, as I explained in, in the, my uh, in my lecture, uh, the, our solar system oscillates um, across the the edge of the of the of the galaxy, and a lot of times, you know, we are trapped behind the star matter and and everything that stops us from getting the the etheric plasma energy from our local neighborhood, which is the galactic center, which is really super important. The black hole, oh. right? Yeah, the black hole at the center of the galaxy. And the white hole. It's everything. It's if, if there's a black hole coming in there, it must be on the other side, you know, with stuff pouring out. So, yes. um, uh, and, and as we, we ebb up above that, which you are now, because we were in the Kali Yuga when we are on the other side of this mass of stars and, and just intergalactic junk in a lot of ways. But now we're rising above it. We're getting it. And we're beginning to understand what's going on for the first time in, probably 2,000, 3,000 years. And I think that's the, what's really going on here is we're literally receiving more of this plasma energy than we ever have before. And I think that's why the sun was yellow when I was young. For my whole life, the sun was yellow. Then about 20 years ago, the sun began to turn white. Now it's blazing white. I'm posturing that the sun is white and maybe other colors all during the other yugas, but only during the Kali Yuga when there's not the energy coming in anymore because it's blocked by this, you know, bandwidth of matter that the sun turns yellow because it does it's just it's pooping out on you. And when the, well, sun, yeah. when the sun turns yellow, we change too. And as it turns white, we also are changing. And that's what's going on, I think, across uh, the planet right now. So are you saying that the sun now is directly receiving more Birkeland currents? Yep, that's what I'm the, saying. The plasma filaments that connect all celestial bodies to one another? Yep, and I think the white is a sign of, of, that, of that process. And that yellow was the dimming of that process. As we, it wasn't receiving that energy anymore, so it was just dimming out. And as it was dimming out, we dimmed out, right? I mean, we are reciprocal of the energy coming in, as you know, and and we began dimming out. I mean, it's just think about the last 3,000 years. You know, um, just I, I think about my great grandfather. You know, he plowed with a horse. Um, he knew about 35 people in his small town in Nebraska, never knew anybody else. He never got on a train or went anywhere never knew anything about other kinds of spirituality or religions, just whatever the preacher told him at Sunday, never had any kind of, and he's a smart guy. I mean, he ran this huge, you know, farm ranch and 200 acres or whatever, and by himself with just his kids, and you know, he definitely was a smart guy, but he had no input of information coming in. So no matter how smart he was, he couldn't really ever I mean, just think about what you and I have at our fingertips compared to that. And I mean, we can like in an hour explore all sorts of incredible esoteric things and um, that we never had before. And, and you don't even have to read it. You can just go on YouTube and there'll be 50 YouTubes in a row of whatever it is you're looking for. And, um, uh, uh, and, and so I think we're, what I'm saying is, is that because we're, uh, we're, we're this, idea of the plasma universe seems so obvious to you and me 
not to others yet, but it will. And I think that as we go up out of the darkness, it's just going to become self-evident that we are living in this plasma universe. And I think we're going to start seeing the plasma creatures. They're going to become more and more obvious to us. We are seeing them. Let's let's help people make more sense of plasma, right? And I think we could start with uh, plasma environments uh, being places of high strangeness uh, because of the extreme ionization in those locations. You could say, sure, you have the energy vortex phenomena uh, created by extreme, extremely powerful energetic geology. But alongside those spiraling electromagnetic fields emanating from the earth, you also have extreme ionization occurring as well, which create can create plasma. And so you can either be having these multidimensional bubble plasma universes occurring like at Mount Shasta. I contend that Mount Shasta, it, there is a bubble plasma universe, not only within it, but surrounding it. And because it has all the geology necessary to create a sustainable amount of ionization, like constant ionization. It's filled with springs, right? Filled with springs going through all of these tiny crevices and through sediment that creates tribal electricity. It's a stratovolcano. So you have the power of the volcanism. Well, all the electrons in the earth are gonna follow those lava shafts up to the surface by, by way of least resistance. And it's directly on a fault line. And so you get enormous piezoelectricity from that pressure. And besides that seismoelectricity from any minor or, or major tremors uh, going on. So you have faulting volcanism and springs. And yeah, there's granite there as well. I've gone to granite features that make the compasses do 360s, just wild stuff. But if you have a sustained amount of energy vortex, uh, an, an energy vortex toroidal field surrounding an area, uh, filled up with massive amounts of ionization. You you could you have the formula necessary for a multi-dimensional plasma universe. And I don't think it's Lemuria personally. I, I think it's I don't think it's necessarily Saint Germain or Adama or whoever you want to call these ascended masters. I think it's uh, they can present themselves to you however you want and however you're most willing to receive them. They could come to you as Mother Mary, if that's going to be the least frightening way you want to receive them. Uh, that's absolutely right. In fact, um, I would long wondered, um, I know other people have heard the story, but, you know, I often wondered why my uh, the guy that I followed early on, Fulcanelli, why he had that name, you know, because Fulcan is Vulcan, which is volcano. And Canelli is tunnel. And I remember getting into the um, volcano uh, shafts in Mount Shasta uh, years ago, um, getting deep into them. They're huge. They're, There's a lot of weird things that happen down there in those caves. A, a lot of and you better, you ritual, should, plasmoids. You should probably not go down there unarmed. I mean, it not because of humans either. There's animals down there that are, um, you know, nesting and doing all sorts of stuff. But they're well, huge. These these um, uh, uh, caverns, these uh, lava tunnels are maybe uh, the ones I was in, 40 to 60 feet in diameter and they're round and the gravel has gotten on the bottom so you can walk on a flatness, but you can see they're round. And when I went in there, I was so, it was so buzzy that I had to like, I had to get out. I mean, buzzy was, meaning the static electricity yeah, was I just, just the whole, my whole head, which well, was buzzy. That's going to be yeah. within the caverns and the lava shafts you're going to be getting probably the most potent contained amount of electrons possible i mean that's, that's it, right. it, and it creates plasma and a lot of people encounter orbs sentient luminous orbs you can call them earth lights willow the, the wisp whatever you like and luminous ethereal uh beings they apparently people are, are running into these beings in the in the lava shafts at least beneath uh, shasta and within shasta definitely and um i was talking to nasim harriman about it uh years ago and i said you know i told him the whole thing i was in the shaft and my hair was standing on end and i felt like i had to get out of there because i wasn't in control of the situation and he started telling me about exactly what you're saying there the vortexes are spinning and you're involved in it and um, and that's why um, you see like those weird UFOs around volcanoes. I don't know if you've ever seen the YouTube. Oh, yeah. Special Popo, Ketapiket, whatever. Yeah. Outside. Do you know how to pronounce that one? 
No. <laughs> Popo, 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 so, <laughs> it's too difficult. But you know it, it Puebla, Mexico. Yeah. I mean, they're so used to seeing UFOs and orbs coming in and out of that volcano that it, they, it's not even interesting to them. That's right. And also lightning. You see lightning all the time at the mouth of a volcano. <laughs> Again, well, a lightning yeah. is attracted to these energy vortex locations because electromagnetism attracts electromagnetism. And you won't only just find extremely spiraled trees in these vortex slash portal locations, but spiraled trees that are then struck and killed by lightning. The, I mean, unbelievable. And I found that in the San Luis Valley at the bottom of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. This, I don't know if you remember, you, you chose not to join that day, the Snake Mound. Oh, yeah, uh, the Snake Mound. In, yeah, so the snake mound, it's built, every tree growing out of that snake mound is not only spiraled, but struck by lightning. Yes, I was, um, uh, um, years ago, I was in the forests of California, uh, Central California, and I noticed that an oak tree was growing among, you know, 60, 80 foot ponderosa pines, but the oak tree was only about 40 feet high, but it had been struck by lightning. And it would just literally have been blown apart in like a million pieces. Wow. It was unbelievable. And I remember uh, I grabbed a piece and took it with me. And I talked to a forest ranger and he said, yeah, it's weird how oak trees um, keep getting hit by lightning when you think the upper trees will get hit by it first. But they don't care about the ponderosa pines. They only care about the oak trees. And then later looking in the oak trees, they're, you know, solid, um, crystal, uh, the bar, uh, the, the wood, that's why, you know, you, they built the ships like um, old Ironside was built out of oak trees because it was like uh, ancient oak trees is almost like um, you're cutting into crystal. You have to sharpen the saw blade like every 15 feet because it just chews it right up. It's just like cutting through diamond. And um, and that's why the the uh, the electricity, the lightning is attracted to the oak tree because it's just this you know, huge amount of crystal granite kind of power that just sitting there attracting all of this energy to it. So there's a mineral or minerals in, in the oak tree that are attracting this, uh, the lightning is what we're thinking? Yeah, that's right. It creates so an electricity. I maybe, I don't think there's quartz just in the oak tree. So maybe it's an iron thing or a metal of some kind. Uh, it's as close to a crystal as you can get. Um, okay you can so maybe it's, it. then it's piezoelectricity going on within the tree is, is well it is and what's going on is that um the oak tree has these really deep roots and it's attracting up water so during the daytime it's sucking up all this water that goes all the way out into the extended branches of the oak tree and then at night when the moon comes up no no i got this wrong when the moon comes up is when the water goes all the way up. So in a full moon, the water is all the way to the very tips of the branches. And then as a new moon comes, the water drifts down. The natives, Native Americans knew this. So in the desert, they would find it, like in California, they would find an oak tree and know that if you went down into the bark um, in the morning, that's when the water was coming back down. You could get yourself a cup of water out of the oak tree. And, you know, the pioneers finally figured out by watching the Native Americans and they didn't die in the desert anymore. But um, so the uh, the oak tree is this giant lung that's pulling in all this water, just like a spring. And then um, the crystalline structures uh, are all around it and the water is shifting all through this stuff and getting all piezoelectric and getting all charged up. And then when, you know, on, a, on the right moment, the lightning will hit it and probably when the water is all the way up and just causes the whole thing to blow up like a gigantic, you know, piezoelectric explosion, basically. And then once again, the, that water flowing through those tight spaces is going to create tribal electricity. So that's going to add another element of power. You got it. That's exactly right. That's why trees are worshipped by the alchemists and the druids and especially the oak tree because it has... And, so the same, you know, water, underground water or movement of water creating electricity is exactly why the pyramids of Giza were placed where they are, of course, uh, along with almost every other sacred megalithic site, yeah, if not all of them. And what happened at Egypt, I think, is that they just decided that, okay, we can go off into the mountains and gather up this stuff, but why don't we just create a convenient area right here among us 
that we can gather up this plasma energy and we can use it to power stuff, but we can also use it to create multidimensional states, which is where the all these you know strange creatures that are in the hieroglyphs, you know, they're, they're, they come from. Because here's the thing, is that we know. Um, I don't know if you if you're familiar with Ko Kozarev. The, uh, oh yeah, I'm obsessed with torsion fields and the Kozarev mirror. I'll be visiting one in, one of those soon. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because <laughs> I, I uh, we messed with the with a Kozarev mirror, a torsion mirror in 2014. Someone here locally had one, and I got to sit in the middle of it for about three hours one night. Oh, how was that? Um, uh, it was like um, doing the cleanest psychedelic that i've ever done uh, wow yeah it was totally clean it didn't feel toxic at all and it was um odd because it was like an inversion of me so i was going through this kind of weird psychedelic experience about me but um but i thought to myself okay so in in a highly um in a high plasma field yeah you have all these weird experiences but is it possible that you know, it's very much like a psychedelic experience, and I think it is. I well, of course. I mean, these energies, whether they be torsion fields or natural uh, earth energy vortices, they're going to be creating, they're going to be affecting our consciousness, like, for instance, uh, Michael Persinger's, Michael Persinger's god helmet you know you have a you put a counter rotating magnetic field around your brain and it will make people feel like god is standing behind them which is why they coined it the god helmet really the quran helmet and but it you know it's the same effect it affects our brain and it affects our entire nervous system yeah and it can cause these you know altered states of consciousness that the shamans of ancient times were using these energies for yeah, I suppose the plants out there, they're creating these same energies as shamanic plants that these plasma fields are creating. But the plasma fields are more pure and and, um, and more dynamic, I think. Well, forget the, the plants. Just being inside, you know, the Great Pyramid or a dolmen or a stone circle in itself has the ability to affect your consciousness enough for you to not only receive massive amounts of downloads, which is what happens to me in all these places I go, I, it's unbelievable, but to connect and per, perceive to a degree other realms of existence and to connect with source itself, potentially. So where have you been? Oh, geez. Um, let's see. I haven't been to Egypt yet, but um, Andrew and I did a whole multiple quests around different stone circles of England, of course, Stonehenge, Avebury, but they're ruinous. They, uh, you know, most of those stones are gone and were used to build the local towns around them. It's the stone circles that are intact, like the Rollwright stone circle. I put out an episode on that uh, somewhat recently myself. The ones that are still intact, all the stones are still there. They are the most potent. And it what Maria Wheatley told me is that that's because they retain their form energy or shape power, you know, like a, a like a magic circle as occultists would do. That circle creates an energy in itself. And if you place it in a place with a lot of telluric currents, a lot of natural earth energies and, and, and in the right way so that you funnel the currents in through around and spin them within the circle, they're going to create these altered states of consciousness states that the ancient shamans would have gone in there to experience and commune with the others the other realms uh but where else i've been just really obscure megalithic sites i went down to teotihuacan um and, and noticed that the telluric currents were being funneled directly mid mid staircase on each pyramid directly into the center of each pyramid and um, I also discovered a place just outside of the remnants of Templo Mayor uh, in, you know, what the remnant remnants of Tenochtitlan in Mexico City. And the locals were telling me, you know, there's a portal right here, right outside the entrance to what's left of Templo Mayor, the, the museum. I said, what are you talking about? They, they, and the local people, they just said, well, people just appear and disappear randomly all the time. And I've Googled this extensively and I haven't found a single thing about it. But I tell you, I went there and I doused it. And, and I exactly where this, you know, local told me where it was. I doused it. It was 10 of my foot feet, 10 of my feet by 10 of my feet in, in diameter both ways. 
And as I doused it, locals started coming by chanting, portal, portal, portal. So it's a known thing in Mexico City that is nowhere on the internet, apparently. Um, Mount Shasta, you know, I've been out to a Crestone area, um, Giant Rock, et cetera. Uh, oh, Bradshaw Ranch is the main case I have going on outside of Sedona, which is the sister site to Skinwalker Ranch. And there's things I'm forgetting, but um, generally there's there's some places that I've been to investigate within the past year. Very cool. Um, yeah, I do the same thing. I try to go out and find as many of these places and try to um, just figure out what they're about. And a lot of times there's like memories locked into them. So mm, yes, especially with quartz, the quartz, just like silicon in a microchip, holds that memory like an akashic record and if you're in a very quartzy place you start picking up on this ancient knowledge of the landscape the genius loci the spirit of the land it, itself even holds this information that's right and you know the whole and there there's a um there's a torus field around the earth you know that um that we're all part of and this all these vortexes are coming down from from this field and attracted to the gravitational pull of the earth and um it's uh, well that's the microscopic level i mean there's a toroidal field around the galaxy and the, the, every celestial body and they're all connected to one another it's a field within a field within a field within a field you know as above so below yeah as i showed in in my lecture how much uh brain uh currents look so much like Birkeland currents i mean it's almost like they a, are a giant brain Absolutely. I, I, I think that's how nature works in general is, is, is currents and fields yep. and they're all working together and they're all connected. Well, maybe science will catch up eventually. We'll see. Although well, Pritzker and other people are catching up, so it's not totally lost. Did I, I told you this new study on ball lightning, right? That it's coming fr in from ball. another, did I not tell you? No, tell me. So ball lightning you know, uh, just a, a natural plasmoid, a uh, plasma within an uh, contained magnetic field, which people keep seeing around the world, these orbs, right? And a lot of them behave sentiently. And that's why they were thought to be the fairies and the jinn and things like that. But yeah, the leading, uh, the most current science on ball lightning is that it's actually portaling in from another dimension. So like Andrew would say, the plasma can work like a, a glove. That's his analogy. And, you know, an, an intelligence can inhabit it and animate it and, and, and interact with us in that form. Or it can just be a inanimate plasmoid that's just naturally ejecting from a very energetic geology. Uh, but because plasma is multidimensional, these beings or denizens, as you would call them, are able to inhabit them and interact with us while in that state because we can finally see them in that state but most plasma is invisible so th imagine all the things we can't see uh yeah it's actually kind of uh, uh daunting to think about it i mean yeah. we could be surrounded right now by millions of uh, plasma creatures and and not know it at all right and you know the weirdest thing is and I know that you're experiencing the same thing. We go to these places, these hot spots, and we hear stories about these sky creatures that are nowhere on the internet. I go and I look for it on the internet, nowhere. But I mean, there's your story of the of the weird manta ray looking thing. Yep. Uh, like you said, luminous, trans, translucent to a degree, opaque. But then also in the San Luis Valley, you have those herds of prairie dragons, which yep. are like slugs and they, they they move in herds just above the ground. I don't know if it's a foot off the ground or two or what, but they move together in packs. I've heard, I've heard so many stories about sky snakes. Yep. So many. I, and you've heard the sky snakes? No, oh, yeah. I actually have I, a, somewhere on my computer here, I have a picture from Chris O'Brien of a prairie dragon, two of them. Oh, no way. I've got to see that. No, I'm, I'm pretty funny. sure that the manta rays that I saw were prairie dragons because they had the same wings and the tail. They were about this big, about this, well, about twice as big as what I'm showing you. Uh, okay, maybe those were the adult, the yeah, yeah, fully they grown. A, they were doing a call in or a ritual somewhere out in the middle of nowhere out here in the valley and and Chris was leading it. And somebody was taking pictures and, and sure as hell, there they were. And they were translucent, kind of whitish. 
and they looked like manta rays. And he sent it to me. Oh my God, that's what I saw. You know, maybe mine were closer than I think. That's what I'm thinking now. That instead of being forty feet away, maybe mine were only twenty feet away. And I just, you know. Well, there's probably so many different species of these things, and like, for, do you do you remember that story where uh, dozens of people watched for hours and hours and hours a semi-translucent, luminescent basically, you know, plasma jellyfish uh, hovering above Mount Shasta. Yep. No, so no, the absolutely. sea creature, oh, I've, I heard another one of a fish, just a somewhat semi-translucent fish just flying through the air in front of somebody. It, they oftentimes resemble sea creatures, but the snakes, I can't help but wonder, are these sky snakes what some ancients were considering to be dragons? Yes, that's what they are. And, and I've seen many videos of them. And they're um, they're translucent, but they're they they go like that, and and the and the sea creatures swim, they move like fish. And the mm -hmm. thing is, is if you think about it, the way that um, that flying saucers are supposed to be shaped, um, there's a great artist. Uh, he wrote a book called The Power of Limits. Um, great book if you can get it. I think he was either Serbian or Yugoslavian. He's gone now. I knew him. He lived in Seattle. Um, he was like 75 when I knew him. And he wrote this whole great book. I have it in my bookshelf about how animals, especially sea animals, have this dynamic of the, just like the Scharberger uh, dynamic of, of that's why the, the uh, trout is able to, you know, swim and stay steady in 40 or 50 mile an hour, you know, creeks. They just stay there and they don't move or anything because the shape that they're in causes the dynamics of everything to flow without resistance. And so sea creatures have it. And uh, I think that's exactly why these plasma beings also share the same kind of, uh, because they're not navigating water, they're navigating this ocean of plasma. And we don't understand the dynamics of that at all, except that it must have you know, water-like characteristics, maybe? I don't know. You know. The etheric ocean, as I've heard you call it before. Yeah, yeah. it's an etheric yeah. ocean, and we live in it, and we don't even know it, <clears throat> and we're blind to it, <clears throat> but only because of the Kali Yuga. <clears throat> and now we're pulling out of the Kali Yuga. It's going to become more and more self-evident. That Our senses happens. are, because. are you saying our senses are becoming heightened to the point where we're able to, we, we are able to perceive a, a broader range of the EM spectrum? Yeah, if you follow, there's certain websites or YouTubes I follow, uh, Mr. BBB or something like that, I can't remember, but what he does is he, people send him videos that they've taken of up things in the sky and weird clouds and all that, and more and more. Um, we're getting to see these creatures that we're talking about. Um, they're showing up more and more. And um, and I don't know if you are you familiar with uh, Dorothy? Is it? Her, uh, no, her not. Uh, no. Yeah. Um, she has a, a documentary on Amazon Prime. Uh, oh. Can't remember the name of it. So something like not something of the light or something like that. She was a housewife, and she just she could see them. And she said, she would say to people, you see that? And they go, no. She said, you don't see that going on over there, right? And they say, no. And then finally her husband bought her a camera and she started shooting it. Somebody in the in the uh, comments is going to know it because everybody, she's a wonderful uh, old lady. She's long gone. Anyway, she would shoot, she would get it. And, and if you know anything about film, so it's 1 18th of a second or 1 24th of a second, depending what she's got the speed of the camera on and she would take one frame and in one frame the light would move um maybe 50 60 feet in one frame one twenty fourth of a second this light would shoot in all directions and so she was seeing these incredible lights which were attempting to communicate with her and and she was having you know getting very frustrated because she knew that they were trying to talk to her and she wasn't quite grasping what they were saying except that you know she was you know very loving person i think that has a lot to do with um the communication between uh humans and the plasma world there's something well, the 
consciousness, the consciousness connection is crucial. I mean, they can feel your intentions. We are electromagnetic. They are electromagnetic. Our consciousness is electromagnetic. And, and if we pay attention to something, it gives it more power and it builds it up. And if we show interest in something, it's, it's going to show interest back more likely than if we're not interested in them. Yeah, and as you know, I think the the philosopher's stone in alchemy is some kind of plasma, not generator, a plasma um, like a battery, a, mm -hmm. a capacitor, like and, and, and it takes plasma and puts it in it, and then it holds it, so you can use it whenever you want, and um, and it's primarily you know electrical in nature, which is why you have to be careful with it, and I think that. Um, I think that we can, um, I mean, we have to be careful who we communicate with in the plasma universe. That's something we have to be careful about. Why I always talk about the fact that there's also not so nice entities out there and you have to be careful, have a protocol. Don't, don't just communicate with anyone or anything. Um, but, but they do want to contact you and they do want to help you. There's a lot of plasma entities that are like fascinated by us and we don't realize it during the Kali Yuga. Now that we're pulling out of the Kali Yuga, we're going to realize that they're not only there, but we're also going to discern which ones are friendly and which ones aren't, you know? And based on, you know, if you're an intuitive person, I'm a very uh, energetically sensitive, intuitive person. I, I can just pick up on is this a negative vibe or a positive vibe or or just nothing you know just indifferent vibe and um i i will interact with things as long as i don't get a bad vibe from them but yeah. before we um continue past the plasma creatures and beings topic i have a story that will blow your mind it's the craziest story i've heard of a sky snake and i've heard this sky snake in crestone and shasta and here's one from Los Angeles, the middle of Los Angeles, well, Bel Air, Los Angeles. And this is one of my best friends. He would never lie to me, never. Yep. Top three best friends. He said, you never believe what happened. I was playing basketball with my friend in the middle of the night, uh, alone on the, on the court. And they saw this, you know, typical filamenty, snake looking, uh, luminescent, semi-transparent, yep. clearly intelligent thing flying around and then it came down between them because it was interested in them and i felt they it, that it was interested in them because they were playing basketball and it's like hey i'd like to join i mean that this is just once you get to the end of the story it, it'll make sense but um so they stopped playing basketball and just stood there and looked at it as it came between them and one end of it was inspecting guy number one the other end of it was inspecting guy number two, coming up close, looking at it, pulling away, interacting on both sides. And then it it shot down, hit the ground and left a black scorch mark on the court itself and then shot back up into the sky. And my reaction was, what? well, why didn't you toss at the ball? Why didn't you keep playing basketball? It came down because it saw you guys playing a ball. It was interested in the activities you were doing. And I think it wanted to join in or at least observe. And in my experience with interacting with these transdimensional entities, the more interesting you are, the more fun you're having or more engaging you are, the more interest they more interested they are in you. If you're playing music, if you're playing dance, if you're dancing, they are gonna all start popping up, um, especially on this SLS Connect technology. Do you know that camera? No. So um Connect uh, it was like the technology for we, right? And it's an infrared camera and it, it can recognize a human form, a humanoid form. Uh, and that's how it could tell where, where you're standing to see if you're hitting the right things. Well, there was this problem where stick figures would appear where there were no, pe there was no person. So it was seeing a humanoid form in the infrared spectrum. And, um, and now it's uh, the best, well, one of the best paranormal investigating tools I've ever seen because I, I just went, came back from Bradshaw Ranch, the sister site to Skinwalker Ranch and the crew from Skinwalker came down to investigate Bradshaw Ranch as well and had amazing results. Um, but we, we were in the ranch house, we brought out the SLS uh, camera, we turned on a Tesla coil because apparently, I've just learned this within the last few months, Tesla coils will make 
things manifest like crazy because they can they can siphon that power and use it to build up their their plasma or their electromagnetic bodies whatever you want to call it to manifest and as soon as we started getting a little silly and having fun playing music they started popping up sitting in chairs with their hands on the armrest crossing their legs like a human would or propping up the leg like a man often sits on the other leg really always the, the hands on the armrest they, they started dancing when we played out music. Um, I know it's ridiculous, but the girls there, including myself, started dancing with them and they were loving it. They were touching on us um, and we felt it when they touched us. They they yeah. shook one of our hands and we felt it when we shook the, they shook the, our hands. And this was like 12 different entities. Some were 12 feet tall, some were like six inches or like a foot tall i'm like is this a fairy is this a fetus what is this a baby like what is this thing and um yeah if the more interesting you are the more interesting interested they are in you and to, to be honest from that experience at bradshaw ranch i'm about to go out next week as well i think these entities just wanted to party i mean that's what it seemed like yeah uh... there's a bar in there they were dancing on the bar as soon as we turn on music they're in line with the music perfectly doing some weird 70s style like straight out of saturday night fever dance on the bar oh that's awesome yeah um <laughs> uh send me a link to that camera i will put it up and people can buy because they're going to go crazy when they, when you hear about it um yeah there's a guy that uh I, I follows me on facebook and he'll send me um every once in a while a, 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 a video and it's him I think he lives in Georgia and he goes out at night um, and he starts playing Bach on his guitar and he puts the camera up and turns it on and he just starts playing Bach and he's a great guitarist and it's just beautiful. And then pretty soon you see these orbs start flying in and he's surrounding the guy and flying all around him as he's playing. And now almost when the Bach reaches its crescendo, the Allegro, right? That's right when they really start coming in and, almost like a, a music video or something. It's quite, quite amazing. Could that guy see them with his naked eye or was this only oh, yeah. seen? On He's like, oh, Hello, friends, how you doing? He's talking to him and telling him that, you know, calling him friends and, you know, everything. And people go, oh, those are satellites. But no, no. I, no, I he's developed know. a relationship, a connection with those beings that attracts them. It's you know, quantum entanglement is what it comes down to. That That connection will always be there. Yeah, the, there's lots of people that do it. There's a, he's now disappeared, but he used to be on, uh, on YouTube as a kid, like 21 years old from Australia. Oh no, New Zealand, and he would go out in a sunny day and he would take a mirror and, you know, go like this for about 20 minutes. You come on, guys, come on. He had a camera all set up and everything, and he'd be doing this and looking like kind of a mad person wait is that why you started setting up mirrors and doing the same thing yourself <laughs> i have yes i do uh, i do that yes i go out uh, all the time i thought you said that trevor constable was the guy setting up mirrors so it was this other new zealand guy then i uh, no, it was a trevor i don't know did trevor set up mirrors i don't know no this was just a kid that i used to watch on youtube and they would they would appear it would take about 20 minutes after he did it he would wait and just sit there and all of a sudden you would see these silvery uh, orbs appear in the sky and start dancing over his head and and everything and you know it was just an innocent guy I didn't even know really what he was doing i don't think he was just you know just doing it he discovered it one day accidentally or something and was just drawing him in but anyone can draw him in is what i'm saying and i think as we get going <laughs> through the um end of the as the kali yuga ebbs away and we fall away from all of this nonsense that we've been involved in we're going to find out that these are um, uh, helpful creatures, both not just spiritually, but uh, with our health. I think they're good for our health. I really do. Not all of them, uh, obviously a, uh, a good amount of them, but you can get anything from anywhere with any intention. Uh, I let me ask you before we move past this, uh, with your mirror experiments, did you cause any plasmoids to show up yourself? Yeah. Yes, but really? again, again, not a right away. So I did it. I did it at like four in the afternoon in the summer. And I waited and waited and I didn't see anything. I was all disappointed. Had my infrared camera and everything all ready to go. And I didn't see anything. And so I got disappointed. And then I went into my house for dinner. And then about seven o'clock, 
I got a call from a neighbor who lives up the hill that can see down, you know, it's all uphill from here from, with me up to the mountains. And he lived up there and he said he and his wife were out on the back porch with their binoculars and they saw these lights over above our house. So this was about three and a half hours after I did it. So I don't know if there was a connection or not, but I think there probably was. They could have been easier to see now that it was darker and they have that glow to them. That's right. There's certain times of the day they're much easier to see. That's right. You got to remember that. They're not easy to see at noon, but anytime after four in the summer, they get easier and easier to see as uh, as the side light happens. Because as, as, as the light's going sideways, you can finally see the opaqueness of them. And they, you know, just, if you, you got to watch them. You got to pay attention because they'll fly by you and you won't even see them, you know? And where you live, honestly, it has every single earth energy possible at, at extreme amplitudes going on constantly because what it isn't it the the highest underground aquifer in north america biggest highest and large aquifer. the highest and largest under the highest and largest aquifers like it's levels different layers of, of aquifers you have the extremely granitic granitic um mountain range yeah. mountain ranges the san juan but also the san grande cristo ending in Blanca Peak. And then the dunes are pure silica. Uh, so, yeah. and the dunes have that water rushing through them constantly. So that's gonna be creating massive amounts of tribal electricity. You have a fault line in the middle of the Sangre de Cristo mountains. You've got the piezoelectricity from the pressure of the faulting and then si uh, seismoelectricity once again from the minor tremors and vibrations that are gonna be happening within that fault. But the water power there, especially just flowing through the dunes it makes sense why so much paranormal activity happens around the dunes and this and the sangre de cristo mountains yeah and also they have what uh, maria wheatley calls the deep water we have your surface water which actually mm -hmm. isn't all that good for you yin honest. water yin water she says is produced by the earth itself yeah. it's not recycled that's rainwater right. that's what we get here and we have hot springs everywhere that has that coming from 2,000, 3,000 feet below the surface. And um, there's just no nothing like it. I mean, that's a water that you cannot get in 90% of the earth. And uh, so that's why water is so important because it's causing the, um, the movement of the piezoelectric energies everywhere. And if, I mean, if especially flowing through sediment and trying to get its way through these little tiny cracks and crevices that the friction of that creates tribal electricity in addition and you know that's why these megalithic sacred sites were placed above these underground aquifers and even a spring if a spring comes up but it gets it hits an obstruction right so it can't come up to the surface but it starts going out on, on underground rivers that area is going to be a super powerful vortex just from that spinning water uh underneath there causing all uh, well at least piezoelectricity and tribal electricity and in in such a velocity that it it creates one of the most powerful vortices that we can get yeah the next time you come here i'll take you to a place that uh, really special i found which has got all that it's got all the underground streams got the uh, weird rock formations around it and um you just walk in there it's like whoa it's really powerful I left it's not the, the, ocean the little people there. i did pick up some orbs one night when i was wow. there so yeah it's a powerful place i'll take you there really powerful it's not the little people homes that you no mentioned. no those are did you go see those no but you told me about them and i want yeah. to see them yeah i'll take you there too yeah yeah the little people homes are really cool and you know no there's there's this whole ceremonial landscape that the natives, uh, and you went to see these petroglyphs, you know, the one with that has the fox? Yep. So, and they're all around there. Um, but if that is what, after investigating there with Andrew Collins, I mean, he's just, he's like, this is absolutely a ceremonial center. This is where the natives came to do their rituals. There's, this is a real power spot. And you have the same carvings that you get at Gobekli Tepe, not just the fox, but then the serpents right next to the fox. So there's something going yeah. on a link between that site and Gobekli Tepe. Yeah, I'd like to do uh, um, uh, underground infrared and uh, radar um, to see, because I think we might find ruins of 
previous uh, cities and things here. Because you got to remember, there's 108 streams that flow into the valley, and they don't become a river. They, it's one of the only places on Earth where you have two mountain ranges with all these streams flowing and no river is created. That water just sits and floats down into the aquifer with nowhere to go. And um, that is a sign of a sort of seriously powerful place. I mean, and, you know, there's very few places that have that kind of power in it. And I mean, that's in my top three, in my mind, most uh, energetically powerful landscapes, just because of the geology alone. And then if you add in the human consciousness connection of all the Native Americans coming there and they would lay down their weapons, there'd be no fighting in that valley. Mm -hmm. They came there to do their rituals and shamanistic journeys to use that power. It was a it was a holy place, a sacred place to them, just like Mount Shasta was a sacred place. And Glastonbury Tour is a sacred place. Stonehenge, it's, it, all of them. They, these uh, these are always uh, oftentimes sacred pilgrimage sites. Yeah, yeah, they were. And there are always these vortexes. And, uh, you know, it's not a, not an accident that, that that's the way it is. And uh, it's quite amazing, actually. And so, we live on what I call the alchemical earth. It's a gigantic plasma vortex and uh, we are the beneficiaries of it. And um, and we don't really appreciate it. I don't think what we where we really live. I really don't think we do. But if we want to seek out these places where we can heighten our consciousness and connect with not only source, but other other intelligences of other realms, we, we can do that. And you'll get the downloads if you go there, you know, Glastonbury tour, they say that's the heart chakra of the earth. I had, I wasn't thinking about that, but when I was at the top, I said to Andrew, I feel a clockwise vibrating energy rotating around my heart. And he looked over, he said, you do remember this is allegedly the, the heart chakra of the earth. I said, wow, well that, that makes a lot of sense right there. And, and Shasta is supposed to be the root chakra. And just is just a, I think it's an, an intelligent being in its own right just from my own experiences there and, and witness accounts super powerful place um I've had several uh odd occurrences there at that area and I uh, just really uh, love going there and kind of miss I haven't been there in like eight years now I want to get back to Glastonbury it's a great place yeah the psychic yeah. phenomena and um and synchronicities and downloads are going to be the the that and the way your body just feels different tingly or dizzy or like you're spinning or like you're falling or like you're soaring those are going to be the first things you're going the human body will notice in a vortex location now if you're there on a on the right solstice or whatever under the right circumstances maybe there was a huge influx of ions releasing from the earth at that time that's when the paranormal like seriously you start seeing orbs or, or some kind of apparition claiming to be Saint Germain, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, those things will happen. And once that, once you reach that certain velocity of energy. That's right. And, and that's what's going on at Mount Shasta and all these other places. They're not really, they're, they're just breakthroughs into this other realm via the plasma energy that's built up. And, you know, if you're into Saint Germain, you're going to see Saint Germain. If you're into, Angels, you're going to see angels. If you're into saints, you're going to see a saint. I mean, whatever, you know, I'll probably see, you know, a white haired alchemist or something. So, um, <laughs> or yeah. the lady of the a lady of Fatima was a kind of a Mother Mary figure, right? Oh, that was a complete plasma experience. Mm -hmm. the totally. Sun that was up in the sky, the fake sun or whatever, the double sun that they saw darting back and forth in the sky. And that was a complete plasma experience by those kids and uh, that was at the end of a long series of events how i i think i if i remember correctly that, where i think it was a luminous woman appeared to the kids right that would be a plasma being yep. and she would appear as such to to not scare them and so that you know they would be welcoming towards her and and positive towards her rather than run away in fear and then people kept coming out and kept seeing these strange plasma i don't i don't know if they were also seeing plasma beings or just the miracle of the sun event at the end which um which was actually the, the exact day of a certain miniature solar cycle that uh that guy that we met at that last conference was talking yeah, about that's right yeah it was exactly then 
That's right. I forgot about that. He did tell me about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. And um, yeah, so they had three events and the third one was the big event where everybody saw it, but they had other events and, and these apparitions of these translucent females, they're, they're everywhere. I mean, Our Lady of Guadalupe, she appears to the little boy in, uh, in, 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 in Mexico and all the tribes are fighting each other and everybody's at war and all of a sudden she appears and all of a sudden there's peace everywhere for the first time in literally hundreds of years in the area and uh these things happen all over the place in in uh in uh Segovia in Bo Bosnia they were appearing um uh, uh so it's something that has to do with here's what I think I'm going to go on a limb here and then I'll, I've got to go but I think that you know how um all through the early UFO stuff um people would meet uh people from Venus or people from some other star system and these aliens would be really concerned about planet earth right and it's like well you're not from here well, why are you so concerned about you know the planet right because they live here exactly they live here it's like come on this is what's going on they may be masquerading as something else but you can see that and here's the other thing i've never really brought up but i want to do a, a show on it at some point and that is the odd uh, coincidence that um, the West discovered psychedelics in the mid-1950s when Wasson went to Mexico and discovered magic mushrooms through his interactions with the shaman there. And he brought them back to the uh, America, got on Look Magazine, and, you know, everybody started doing them. And, and that happened at the same exact time that the UFOs were becoming prominent in the exterior world where the normies were seeing all these UFOs everywhere, the baseball games and whatever, all of a sudden the UFO would appear. And, you know, I was a young kid and I was watching all this going, oh, I wonder what's going on here. And I think there's some kind of weird relationship between the two. I think that the plasma beings got very concerned because we blew up a gigantic, huge amount of plasma explosions, which blew holes all over the space-time continuum, and the intelligent plasma beings got really, really um, upset and came in and masqueraded as spirits and as jinns and as aliens and and uh, there she is. There she is. There she is. Talking about aliens. And, <laughs> uh, and anyway, that's what I think. I think that there's some weird relationship between the nuclear bombs going off, psychedelics, and UFOs and plasma beings. There are port uh, there are physical entities also portaling in is is what I'm finding in these places. I mean, it sounds really? ridiculous, but Bradshaw Ranch down outside of Sedona, one of the main things that's been reported there are dinosaur sightings, and a lot of Bigfoot sightings. And I think you and I actually do disagree on, on Bigfoot on this. And I'll, I'll just be real quick about it. I think, um, I think Bigfoot is probably time portaling an ancient hominid that's time portaling in because the stories that I'm getting from this ranch are that they are seen in this energy, etheric, uh, semi-transparent body. And then they physic, they, then they manifest physically and then they phase out into a, their less physical amorphous form and people have seen them phase in and phase out and what if this ancient hominid which i think might be called paranthropus because they have the cranial ridge maybe they developed differently their senses developed differently to be able to navigate these portals uh at will i think here's the thing okay we have hundreds of uh uh, uh, uh motion cameras out in the woods i have them right and we never pick up any Bigfoots or any Sasquatches. They never get picked. And I think the reason is because they can see into the infrared. And they yeah, they sense the technology, the technology and they don't like it. And they're like, I'm not going over there. They exactly. Over there. And I think that they can see where these portals are and they hang near them in case they have to get out in a bad situation. Because the people that I know here locally who have seen Bigfoot, um, and I trust them, they're good friends of mine, um, they told me that there was this weird translucent haze around 
this 12 foot tall uh, creature that they saw and they and they couldn't figure out what it was they were mystified by it and Plasma. it did it, that's what they said it looked like it had this like weird glow around it um strange right i mean so maybe they can they can go from plasma body to physical body back to plasma body yeah maybe they i, I mean the ufos tell. can do that i think ufos can do that i think they can become almost hardened uh the plasma becomes so dense as it gets more gravity that it almost looks like you're looking at polished aluminum or something but it's not because if you look at the uh uh Rettlesham ufo thing that yeah. guy he when he touched that ufo he got shocked right mm -hmm. Bam, mm -hmm. it's like right because and, and it didn't really his description yeah it was sort of ufo shaped but you know it came in as kind of a cloud and then it hardened and turned into something hard he touched it shocked and then as it escaped it went back into like this plasma cloud and so i think that they can masquerade even as objects is what i'm saying the question is how many of these things are actually structured craft portaling in and out and how many are just plasma beings or creatures that are just representing themselves or portraying themselves as structured craft because that's what we want to see in this ufo cult day and age which is what is happening in the community unfortunately and people like you and i are concerned with well hey to wait a second they I don't think they're all these ETs in their structured craft traversing space time to get here. I think a lot of this stuff is coming in from other realities, dimensions, other layers of the EM spectrum we normally can't perceive. Right. Uh, so I think that this whole religion on aliens really needs to just chill out and we need to start thinking about a bigger perspective going on here. Thank you. That's exactly why I had you on because I think that's what we have to do. We do. We have to widen our horizon here and look at it in a different way. And even the things that we think are alien may not be so far away from Earth either. There may be craft that are here on Earth and have been with us a long time. And they may know about all this uh, plasma stuff. Probably they do. And, you know, I like to say that alchemy is really alchemy. It's the, it's the study of of the Elohim, the science of the Elohim. And, and the and science, science of portals. And the science of portals, which is exactly right. And, uh, Absolutely. and if you've seen that new MH370 video of the uh, disappearing aircraft, which I don't know if you've seen it yet, but it's out all over the internet where the three objects spin around it and then boom, it disappears. To me, that is not aliens. That's probably US Navy. And it's proof that we are in control of portal technology. And they, that craft was on fire. It had a lithium battery fire and it had I don't know, 17 top scientists on board and they couldn't let that thing crash. And they grabbed it and they put it through a portal. Have you seen that so, video? Uh, no. Are you saying this was like a Philadelphia experience, experiment, but in the air? Okay. So in, in 2014, uh, Malaysian airline, a flight MH370 disappeared yes. out of, uh, right after it took off in Malaysia. And what happened is, is that this satellite reconnaissance uh, imagery got released, two got released, and the, both of them show the same thing. And basically, you see the plane, it's starting to go down. It's got fire coming out the back. You can definitely see it's on fire. It definitely had a load of lithium batteries. We know how bad lithium fires are. And they had these top scientists on board, software scientists on board. And as it was going down, all of a sudden, th first one object appears and then two more appear and they start doing a rotating thing. Really Google this. You won't believe it. And they Were they orbs? Like yeah, luminous orbs, orbs? Orbs. And they spin and they get faster and faster. And then, boom, it just disappears. And the trail of the smoke ends right there. It doesn't keep going. The trail of the smoke from the fire ends right where the explosion happens, proving that it was real. Not, you know, people say, oh, it's uh, Photoshop. But there's another video that was taken from another angle that shows the same exact thing. And it's proof beyond any shadow of a doubt that we have this portal technology and that we can knock. They probably say that these people are probably still alive is what I'm saying. 
Well, how do you know? How do you know that was human activity? That could have been the d denizens trying to portal that into their their own dimension. And for all we know, yes, it very well could be. But I have other evidence that the Navy has this technology, and I'm going to present that soon. But uh, right outside of Malibu, um, there appear to be these orbs that go right into where a helicopter is coming in, kind of scan it and then go away, right? And I'm thinking, oh, well, this could be some kind of AI, you know, invented by the Navy, except that James Trevor Constable, long before there was AI, was also seeing these same things. So, you know, I'm at a loss. I got to be honest with you about the whole thing. I can't Well, it could be military in Malibu because there's that tunnel yeah. that's been found that goes right into Point Doom, essentially. I'm not sure if how close to Point Doom it was. Right there, right there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. That, that that seems military over there. It does, and you know, John uh, John Lear told me that that tunnel goes all the way to Nevada, and that there's um, submarines that go to a repair base that's way out in the middle of the desert in Nevada, and I thought, well, that's a bunch of crap, right? So I was out in that area after a couple of years after he told me, right, and I said, I'm I'm going to go to this place, you know. He said that there's this big base here. I'm going to see if it's there. And sure as hell, I went and I found these gigantic, big, huge buildings and totally secure area right out in the middle of the desert in Nowheresville, outside of Lovelock, Nevada. And um, and he was right. There it was. And it said U.S. Navy facility out in the middle of the desert. It was a U.S. Navy facility. So, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, what is that? Uh, two, three hundred miles? No, more than that. 400 miles uh, would have to be a ton. Well, it's, it's not at all hard to create plasmoids or plasma in general. It's not hard to create a portal. You just need two counter-rotating toroidal fields, yep. electromagnetic toroidal fields in the same place at the same time. And that will, in that column, that vorte vortex column in the middle, it will start to pinch space-time to the point where it can actually create a singularity that can expand into a portal. That that technology's been around it, since ancient times. I mean, there's no way that the the you know powers that be aren't aware of it. And then we met that guy. Well, I knew him before, but you met him at that conference. That's creating these plasma creatures that are interacting and behaving intelligently. You know, he says go left, go right, and they're they're doing it. They're they're interacting. Absolutely, it's like an incredibly new world and new science is dawning down on us. And it's up to us to get the word out. You know what I mean? I mean, that's what that's why I like what you and Andrew are doing because you're really getting the word out. And then this reciprocated into Robert Temple's book. And it's like, wow, this is such a great thing because we're finally getting like, you know, this like a wave going here. And, and I, yeah. yeah, Andrew and, recommended this and so are you. So I'm going to. Yeah, I had him on my show about a year ago and it took me, I ordered that book a year ago. I got it like a month ago. So I don't know. Okay, what wow. What, what happened there? I got mine in a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on with your publisher, Robert, but you better get it straightened out. Anyway, I'm going to have Robert back and I'm going to have Andrew back and because I want to get this conversation going. And I think you're right. I think what we need to do is someone, if you're out there and you got money, we need to create a conference where we bring mm. together all these people that are interested in this. And you know, it's sort of a parallel UFO conference. It's not a UFO. Well, sure, conference. UFOs has it. It has its place in the esoteric community, but there are hundreds, if not thousands, of other subjects that encompass esoterica in general. You know, we should have, you know, electron alchemy, a lecture on Kabbalah, electron hermeticism and Gnosticism, and then we can talk about portals in another lecture, and and sure, UFOs in another, and then let's learn about the jinn. Let's learn about the fairies because. I would encourage people to stop looking at everything as ET aliens coming to visit from another planet, because so many of these things, at least what the science is showing us in, in this modern day and age, is that they're coming in either from other realities, dimensions, uh, universes, or th they're just here with us and our senses are not able to perceive them. All of the above is probably what's going on, in my opinion. I would absolutely agree. You, you put it succinctly right there. That is exactly right. All of the 
99% of the paranormal experiences are coming from interaction with this plasma universe. And um, once you understand that, you're no longer afraid of it. It's something that's just there and you just have to accept it. And once you accept it and you can see it, you can see how absolutely beautiful it actually really is. And it should be very exciting for curious people because once you start interacting with these things, you can learn so much more information you didn't have access to before about other dimensions, possibly about source itself. So, I mean, like you believe that alchemy is about really communicating with these otherworldly intelligences and bringing that information back and using these portals to explore other realms. And I think that that's really the next stage in this esoteric community. I mean, people are, are over the UFO religion because we've learned everything we can about UFOs at this point in time. Now let's let's move on to the next steps uh, as to what else is going on that we haven't covered and we can learn new things about. Absolutely. Uh, I just really love where you're coming from. I really do. <laughs> let's do it. Let's get it going. All right. Absolutely. All right. Well, Helena Resner, um, thank you for coming on my show. I really appreciate it. You're a joy. And um, uh, one day I'll tell the story of how we met. And okay. uh, all right. Uh, yes, we shall. It was definitely a synchronicity. Definitely. So we were meant to meet and uh, work on things in the future. And I'm glad to have run into you recently. And yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, well, good luck. Uh, I think you've got a really good future in this uh in this process and i look forward to watching you uh, advance all right well the Roz files on youtube you can find me there i'm just putting up snippets for now but the documentaries are coming and they're going to be intense and it's it's going to be some stuff people haven't heard or seen before send me a link to the Roz files and everything else so that i can put that up for you and uh, help you all that i can oh absolutely well thank you thank you jay and you have a wonderful rest of your day you too okay Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. I'm Jay Widener, and you've been watching Reality Check. Thank you for watching. Help me hit 40,000 subs. And um, I hope you, I thought this subject was interesting. It's like my favorite subject, and uh, I can't get Mine too. Yeah. All right, everybody. See you later.